My name is Rick Roberts, and this is a continuation of the Legends of the New Haven County Bar interviews. And it's my pleasure today to be speaking with a, a, a legend, uh, Willie Dow. Good, good afternoon, Willie. How are you? How you doing, Rick? I'm, I'm just great, thanks. Um, I'm just going to do a really quick introduction because um, you have just so many credentials it could take all the time just to talk about them. But um, Willie's a New Haven, New Haven fellow, um, born and bred here. Uh, went to Yale undergrad, UPenn Law School, worked in the Peace Corps, worked as a federal public defender, um, certainly considered one of the preeminent criminal lawyers in the state, has had um, some of the, the largest and most uh, notorious cases. Involved. One, for example, he's represented our former Governor Rowland. Um, he's been a, a lecturer in trial practice at Yale Law School. He's on every kind of best list and um, has has helped written has helped write the uh, code of evidence. Um, he's tried over a hundred cases, and it's a it's just a, a pleasure to speak with you today. Pleasure is mine. So let's start at the beginning. Um, tell tell me what attracted you to the law, Willie. Well, I didn't really want to go to law school. I was uh, after college. I was going to go in the Peace Corps, which I did. And when I, uh, uh, but before I went, I was sitting next to a fella in the history class. He said, uh, what are you doing next year? I said, I'm going to Peace Corps. He said, you ought to try law school. I, he encouraged me to apply. I applied, I got accepted by a number of law schools. I was all set to go to the Peace Corps. I wrote to them and said, uh, anybody want to hold a spot? And of the, those that accepted me, only one did. I came back from the Peace Corps wanting to return to Latin America, and my Ita three Italian uncles took me out and screamed at me on a golf course for 19 holes and said, you can't uh, disappoint your mother by not going to law school. So that's how I got to law school. It was a burning desire not to go. And, and thanks to your mom, here, here you are. Um, and uh, so did, did you... Um... You went. You were in the Peace Corps. Did you? Did you yeah. become fluent in Spanish? I was uh, when I got yeah, a colloquial Spanish. So I was out in the boondocks, and I was able to. I couldn't read it or couldn't write it, but I could talk it. I could talk it real good, uh, in a limited context. If you if you sent me to the uh, to the nation's capital to deliver an address to the president, not so good. But if you wanted me to talk on the street, I was fine. There you go. I would imagine that might come in handy in, in practice if you, you know, a little, enough to be dangerous, probably. Yes, yes. So tell me about your early um, years in private practice. Um, I mean, I, when I uh, started practicing in the mid 80s, um, you were uh, with, with the firm Jacobs Grudberg Belt and Dow, or at least it became that, that firm. Um, and uh, sadly, we just, we just lost Howard Jacobs uh, recently and David Belt um, recently. Mm -hmm. And more recently, Stanley Jacobs, who was Stanley's here when brother. I first came. Yeah, that's right. That's right. His brother and um, and and Howard um, Ira Grudberg's not practicing anymore. He was but, retired. Yes, was retired. But uh, tell tell me about um, that, your early years. Sure. Well, I started out elsewhere. I started out um, in the in the legal services in Florida. <laughs> that program folded. I went to legal services in Washington. Was with the public defender there. Then I came to. My, my dad passed away. I had three kids then. <clears throat> I wanted my kids to get to know my, my family, my, the uncles I mentioned, and my mom. Uh, I got here as a um, prosecutor, assistant U.S. attorney. And in growing up, the only lawyer I ever knew was this guy named Jacob, Howard Jacob. And one day, the court reporter, back in the days when we had court reporters, remember that? Uh, Came up to me and said, hey, uh, you're going to stay here forever. I, this guy Jacobs is looking for somebody. Would you want to be interested? I said, yes. And I ended up here. Wow. Just, in 1974. And that was a very long partnership for sure. It was. And it was, uh, you know, I've always said practicing with Howard Jacobs and Ira Grubberg was learning how to be, play baseball from Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. It was You couldn't have matched it. It was a terrific experience. Now they they both they both did um, both civil and criminal, right? They did, yeah. I, I drifted almost exclusively to criminal, but yes, and they were both terrific lawyers. They really were. 
Yes. Yeah, so well, I, I knew them both well and I'm, I'm 63, but I've uh, been around a little bit, but they're both. They're that, both. That, those are Rick. Those are what you call the legends of the bar. Okay. <laughs> well, you're the best we could do at this yeah, point. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, I've, I've had a couple of funny conversations about like, how did I become legend? I said, everybody else is dead. Sorry. What can I say? Yes. Yeah, so that's um, about, that's pretty much no, true. You, 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 you've earned it on your own. Let's face it. Um, and um, so you pretty much have, have stayed in the criminal arena most of your right. life. I've done administrative stuff. I've represented a bunch of lawyers in, in uh, you know, grievance matters. Uh, I've done some administrative law stuff, not a lot of personal injury stuff at all, and no divorce. I, I like how your website says you do um, white collar and criminal work, which is implies <laughs> something about white collar criminals that, you know, are, are they not criminals or something? They are the unjustly accused, Rick. I surprised <laughs> you don't know that. Of course that. So tell, tell me a little bit about your white collar practice, because I don't do any criminal work. Uh, well, you know, white collar cases are the cases people like to get, the, the, the criminal defense lawyers like to get, because there are greater fees involved. They're also more complex. They tend to be in federal court. And the, the type of lawyering um, appears to be different. Let me put it that way. The, 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 Basic nuts and bolts of what you're doing, you're still talking to people, you know, and figuring out how to do that. When you get into the federal court, I always like to say, you know, state court and federal court, state court is like the chapel, federal court is like the cathedral. And there's a cost to that. If you go into the cathedral, everything's a high mass and everything is super serious and there's no fooling around and communication is impeded by the trappings, the high ceilings, the big, all that stuff. State court, you can talk to people and you can communicate much better, I feel. Uh, on the other hand, the white collar cases tend to be, like I say, more complex. You get experts, hopefully you get big fees and, and uh, uh, defendants unjustly accused who can afford them. Sure, I mean, I imagine there's a lot of cases involving financial, I mean, embezzlement and so forth. Have you become are, yeah. pretty Thanks. pretty familiar with the uh, forensic accounting methods and so forth? I, 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 I'd be lying if I said I was. You, 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 you buy those guys. Those are experts. You hire them. You get them to analyze and then tell you what the, the short version, and then you work with that. So this is just a quick digr digression, but I, I've got to ask you because, I mean, you and I have had, had cases on and off throughout the years. And you have one of the the best voicemails that I that I know, and and I've always wanted to ask you about it, and now I have a chance. And it says, depending on the day, I'm either counting my blessing blessings, cursing my fate, or saying the rosary. So it's just I I thought of that just now because you mentioned the cathedral chapel uh, yeah. analogy, but but tell me how that came to pass and and what you mean by it. Uh, well, what I mean by it is it's, it's true, <laughs> you know, every day. I think every day is kind of a challenge. And, you know, some days you're counting your blessings. Other days you're cursing your fate because it ain't going the way you planned it to, to go. And ultimately you're going to have to deal with the, who made you, I guess. Uh, and I just throw that part in. And, and, and you know, it is um, probably, a, some would say it's foolish to come on that way to your clients. You're some snooty guy from Washington, D.C. who's looking for a big shot lawyer. You know, why do you want to talk to this Yahoo? But if you don't like it, then don't, you know, don't follow through. I, I, I'm candid. I, that's the way I am. You, you I always have it. struck me as someone who, you know, doesn't pull any punches and um, is, is pretty much down, down to earth, despite your, you know, reputation as, as an elite, elite criminal lawyer. You, you are pretty down to earth. Well, it, it's, uh, it, there's less, less pretending is easier, it seems, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Um, and speaking of which, um, you know, I know you say that you're, you're either counting your blessings or, or cursing your fate, but you, you seem to be a, a pretty upbeat guy. And, you know, we, we're all under a lot of stress, but I've always, I've always, you know, you and I always tell jokes. We, we always yeah. seem to just, I mean, obviously it's nice to have, you know, people you've known for a while, but, 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 and, and you've even written a lot about this in the New Haven County 
um, publication. I know, um, and you, I, I enjoyed your article, by the way, about the pandemic. And oh yeah, you, thanks. <laughs> you you were pretty candid about how you know even you, one of the most upbeat guys I know. It's it it's got it gets to us. It t- tell me a little bit about that. What sparked that article? Oh well, because I was concerned that it put me off my game. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to bounce back to get back on my game because my world was going in in the morning, dealing with four or five people, running off the court, getting some phone calls and being involved in that rhythm. And all of a sudden that stopped. And so then you were forced to rely on yourself and your own uh, self, you know, your own self-discipline, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that concerned me. I don't know that I fulfilled my responsibilities to myself in that regard or to my client. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm right now I'm in the, in a month, I'll be 80 years old. Okay. I don't feel that. Okay. And I, I I consider myself in pretty good shape, but I, you know, uh, you want to make sure that you can deliver for your clients. And that's always been a concern to me. And I thought the pause in our practice, you know, where everything stopped, basically, uh, was disrupting. None of us like change. COVID required us to get bigger changes. And I'm older than I was, and am I capable of making, you know, you can only turn so many ships around in the Suez Canal, you know, they had a problem a while ago, you know. so, the, 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 you know, that's what prompted the article. And the, and but it, it was very it. honest because I think we all felt that. We all felt that it, it's easy to kind of lose your groove and, and momentum. And, 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 and I think we're, we, all, we all probably got a little off our game because, you know, we're people people and we're talkers. And, yeah. and I, I thrive on, on human interaction. And it's, it's, been, it's been challenging emotionally, but also I think professionally. I think you put your, your, your finger on it. Um, but but pre-pandemic and and just to get off that subject for a moment, you you always seem to have you you don't seem like like the kind of person who is actually cursing your fate. I think I think you seem like you're more counting your blessings most days. And and tell me a little bit about how you keep such a upbeat demeanor. Well, I, I married very well. Uh, I have a bunch of kids who provide. Um, a positive aspect or some sense that maybe I did something okay, you know, it's not. And you mean a bunch, you have, you have what, five, six, you have a lot, right? Seven, seven. Seven. that was close. All right. But they're all adults. Everybody's 36 or older. Okay. And so, you know, that's a whole different world, but you know, you're only as happy as your unhappiest kid. And yeah, I, I, I appreciate that I'm perceived to be upbeat, but I listen, I worry a lot about, I worry about my cases. I worry about my kids. I worry about doing a good job. Uh, and I think all of us who are, who aspire to be decent lawyers do. I'm, I'm very lucky. I work with some terrific lawyers. I have in the past, I do now, uh, and they're inspiring. And, and you know, nothing, uh, let me just inject this. Over the past 10 years, I've taken a kid who wants to spend a gap year and, and spends it with me, being essentially almost a little gopher. Uh, and those kids kind of invigorate you, you know, because they don't know what you know and everything you say to them is kind of new. And most of them are smart enough to nod and smile even then when you're making a fool of yourself. <laughs> they, sure. they pretend they're interested. So yep. that's kind of invigorating. Have you... Um... I mean, how, how have you managed? I mean, I have two kids, but I, I've always found it a struggle to meet that personal professional balance. And I know a lot of younger lawyers um, finding their way of the same struggle with families. How, how, how did you manage to raise seven children and have such a demanding practice? Uh, I go back to my answer, the last one, which I married very well, which is true. I don't, that's not, you know, we all say that, believe me. I did. And, uh, you know, we always wanted a bunch of kids and, and we, you know, we didn't, I don't have to go to Paris to have a good time. I'm not a entertainment guy. I'm not a, you know, I, I'm so, 
having kids around and, and, and meeting those requirements, which is, you know, going to ball games, going to stupid uh, plays that you can't understand <laughs> or musical performances. I think those are fun. And if you think about it, the, the best friends you make in many ways are parents of kids that hang around with your kids. Sure. Uh, and, and because there's, they see the whole picture. They're not professional people you deal with when you got your coat and tie on for talking like a lawyer, being a big shot. It's, uh, you know, when you had a flat tire, you can't mow the lawn or you lost something or you got pissed at your kid and hit him in the head and somebody sees you, you know? <laughs> and right. those are people you really have to be real with. Right, so, right. I don't know. Well, well, I, I admire that. And um, I mean, speaking of, I don't know, the balance and, and uh, younger lawyers, uh, do you, any pearls of wisdom you have for younger lawyers, if you think back of what, what's worked, what didn't work? Um, uh, you know, everybody in a, in a, a, a more mature, the older guys are always gonna say about the younger guys, they don't do the same things that we did when we were kids. And that's, that's, a, that's a loop that keeps on repeating itself. I think there's always truth to it, not as much truth as the older guys say there is. Uh, what influenced me significantly when I was younger and when I came to private practice was Judge John Reynolds. I don't know if you remember him, Rick. Sure I do. He used to say, you know, you have two obligations. First, protect your client. Second, look out for the other lawyer. And um, not everybody buys that. In fact, I didn't, you know, that was, I, I didn't come uh, upon that because I was bathed in the holy water. I mean, it, 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 I, I heard it from him, I thought about it, and it made sense. And it made sense of how to deal with people. And I always thought it was better, uh, if you could, to kind of make feel, people feel better. And it's not easy in this business, make people feel better, and it's easier to get the job done. Very often what we do, what we want is better for your adversary because it gets us both to the place where we wanna be. And the, the, the skill, I guess, is making sure your adversary understands that. If I give you this, then you give me that. In the criminal business, for example, I wanna plea to X and a sentence of zero, let's say. Well, he's charged with four counts. Mr. Prosecutor, if you drop those charges down to two from four, it costs you nothing. It gets me good with my client. He'll then be willing to enter the plea thinking he's got a good deal. So there, you know, it's a multifaceted whatever. Uh, I think that's that's well put. I mean, I, do you feel that that concern about the other lawyer and I think the camaraderie that that you and I, and certainly most people our age have felt throughout the years, do you think that that's waning? Um, uh, yes, well, the, the, can't, the pandemic has kicked the hell out of it, yes, because we don't see each other. If you think about it, and I, I just came upon this, the news we exchange with each, each other now in the pandemic and beyond, so at this point in time, is always, this guy got sick, somebody died, but it's all kind of bad news. And the reason that's what we give other people is because we don't have casual interaction anymore when we can bullshit about a, a, a ball game or a, a, a new development and that something happened on the green or some bit of gossip about somebody running off with somebody else. All we got is bad news. And I, I don't know if you experienced this, but I, it bothers me that that's all I can deliver. And that's all I can receive. Hmm. I want to be able to, you know, tell a joke or gossip or something. And we're, we don't have the context within which to do that. We're doing this on a right. Zoom, right? You exactly. know, if, if this were different, I wonder what the difference would be in this interview if you and I were in the same room. I think it would be, I think we probably would chat a lot more before and after for one and it, 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 you're right. It's 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 a de much different social interaction. It's, yeah. it, you can't help but sort of formalize things when you're doing a Zoom talk or yeah, yeah, it's yeah. True. Well, well, this we know is going to be recorded, so you're gonna you got to be a little bit aware of what you're saying and how you're going to come across. I think I've crossed that line twenty minutes ago, but 
<laughs> only, only, be, only because I'm the interviewer, and you I'm, usually, that I'm usually the, the I usually am the first to cross the line, and <laughs> I'm, proud, I'm proud of that. Um, but speaking of that sort of you know collegiality, I mean, this is of course sponsored by the New Haven County Bar Association. Yeah. What what role do you think the bars played in in your in your career and in in that um, collegiality you found with other other lawyers? Uh, well, you know, you you talked about the marble columns of the publication. Uh, I like to express myself, my point of view about things, just a perspective on things. So the COVID pandemic was one, and I periodically uh, wrote articles for remarkable columns over the years about people I work with, events that happen in court, things that kind of struck me as a little bit either unique or funny. Uh, so that has been, just speaking strictly personally, a great um, vehicle for me to express myself. And that, and it's given me, the, the county bar has, has given me that. And I work with John Einhorn, Jonathan Einhorn, as you know, who, who is the editor, and he works like crazy to put that together. And that's been enjoyable. The uh, there are bar functions when we recognize people. We have an annual dinner. It was I don't know this year. I think it was kind of half, half private, half, half in, half out. Yep. You know, it's, and it's and we're, again we're getting back to things. Um, I, I think the bar. It's harder for the bar. I think younger mm -hmm. folks don't participate in the bar as much as they used to. I used to think it was a big deal to be on a particular committee or to be asked to. Uh, speak at a seminar and stuff like that. I think people now uh, think that's more of a burden and, and there's less payback. That's my instinct on that. I think you're right. And I think they're wrong because personally, I can say it's been rewarding, you know, not only on a personal level, but I mean, I, I love the fact that most lawyers I have cases with, I'm friendly with. I mean, I may not, I may not socialize with them or, right. or, I, might, or I may, but, but I, I probably have had you know, had some interaction outside of the of a courtroom, which is which is really important. You know, as I think back, uh, and and I say it here intentionally because I know this will be preserved, whether you this is part of what goes out or not. If you think about Terry Witt and how valuable she was to the Haven County Bar, I did not appreciate the dimensions of her input when she was with us, and uh, and I regret that I didn't. Uh, because she was very, very valuable to us. While we're running around in circles being big shot, she was trying to keep this vehicle afloat or moving forward, you know? You're so right. I mean, I would not have been involved. I, I was president 10 years ago. I, I would not have been involved if it wasn't for her. She just had yeah. an, a sort of uh, enthusiasm that was infectious. And, and she also understood the need for the personal call yep. the personal you know like if you want to you want to recruit someone you make that personal actually i should throw a shout out judge alice bruno was the one who got me involved in new haven young lawyers in the late 80s and that's that's really the reason i got involved back when but i took took some time off uh and, and then got back involved again in, you well know, the, in think of what you're saying so when i began when i went to law school there was one woman in my law school class i think or two or three whatever and now on the criminal side of the court, I don't think this is true on civil. You can go in a courthouse and you'll be the only guy in the courtroom. Female judge, female prosecutor, uh, female marshal, female stenographer, female courtroom clerk, you know, uh, female, 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 defendant. Defendant. female criminal defender. <laughs> you left that yeah, one out. Female defender. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, and that's added so much, I think. Uh, I, I think we may be better behaved or either better behaved or more aware of more concerns than we were certainly when I started. And I listen, I'm a traditionalist. I, I'm inappropriate with language. I don't touch people. But, but you know, I say things that, that I think um, aren't always completely appreciated by all. Let's put it that way. Or maybe not politically correct by you know today's standards. I know I I am in the same category. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of willing to take the hit up to a certain point, but I believe I believe in treating people with, with respect, and I also believe in fooling around. Okay, sure. and I don't I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Well, I, that's I've always enjoyed. You know, I I mean 
as you know, my, my hobby, I mean, I, 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 I always enjoy a lawyer who can tell a good joke and has a great sense of humor. And, and you, you certainly have it not only in person, but in your writings, you know, for the marble column, mm-hmm. but um, just to change the subject a little bit, um, speaking of being in the courtroom, um, you know, I, I know this is kind of a, 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 an amateur layman question, but how have you sort of come to terms that you, you mentioned saying the rosary when you, when you representing just plain bad people? I know it's a dumb question, but I'm a civil lawyer. So, so give me some insight into that. Well, I mean, if, if you buy pretty much any religion, it's, it's the, dig- the dignity of, of the human individual. And, you know, and everybody deserves a second chance. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Oscar Wilde said it, but he stole it from uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Francis, I think. Every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. You know, and that's true, okay? Now, but I don't, I'm, listen, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not taking people home and feeding them because they, uh, they're a bank robber and they can't make bond or something like that. But I think everybody deserves uh, constitutionally, certainly to be treated uh, fairly. And, you know, uh, Bobby Casale, who's a great lawyer says, you know, nobody's ever as good as they think they are or as bad as other people think they are. And, and there's some of that. So. Not everybody I represent is a saint. They they deserve to get treated uh, fairly. And very often what you're doing in the criminal side is you're stopping people from being crushed and destroyed, right? That's you wanna make sure that they're, they're, there's a perspective to what's involved. I so mean, that, obviously, that's how I deal. I think that's a great summary. I mean, obviously um, we all know as lawyers that if, if the, you know, the, wor- the worst, actors don't have representation, our justice system falls apart. But I mean, I'm, I live in Cheshire, and we all know the most horrendous crime in yeah. the state. And yeah. people were like, how do those lawyers represent them? And what I say is, they're freaking, they're saints, they didn't want to take that case on, you know, but but someone had to do it. And, yeah. uh, and they, they really, they really were saintly to, to, to deal with that kind of, well, thing. you know, just to extrapolate on that. So the reason our society stays together is, is really rule of law, that we, we accept common legal principles. Uh, and one of those is people being treated fairly. And when that frays, then society begins to fray itself and disintegrate. And that's what we're going through in large part now. The foundations we've had about telling the truth, treating people with respect, treating people fairly, uh, ask yourself whether we're at the same spot now as we were six years ago, five years ago. Sure. Now it seems to be acceptable to have to not tell the truth, and shame as a as a modifier for our behavior has disappeared. Nobody's ashamed anymore. They'll say say and do anything. Right. Uh, and and I and then and then broadcast it to ten million people. That's what I mean. Yeah. So I mean, gee, I. I you know, we, we all have this, uh, this scintillating interest in this kind of, you know, off color stuff, you know, and you do it. As a, but at some point, you got to say, geez, enough of that crap. Come on. You know, sure. so. exactly. No, that I think that's that's well put. Um, now, um, you're, you've been doing this a while and you're still doing it. Um, tell me what keeps you going. Uh, fear. <laughs> I'm afraid of not doing a good job. I, and I, it, this is tough. I'm preparing now for a trial. And it's just killing, tearing my guts out. But I, you know, so, uh, and I want to make sure that I'm doing it right and treating my clients, and giving my clients what they're entitled to. And I hope I recognize when that doesn't happen, then I'll uh, do crosswords or something. But I mean, you, you seem like the type that is going to keep going so long as you can. And I'm wondering, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure you can, you could have retired many years ago. I'm just wondering, you know, what it is that motivates you to, to get up in the morning and do this. I think it's, I think it's a compliment. I've always said to, um, said to everybody, when the, when the client cha- chooses you to be his lawyer, that's a terrific compliment. Better yet is when a lawyer chooses you to be his or her lawyer. And what a compliment that is. So it is, you know, you'd, you'd be lying if you said there wasn't ego involved in the thing, you know, you think, and we all think we're cock of the walk and we're not. <laughs> you know? Sure, sure. But, but I mean, you, 
you, you don't you don't you don't have to prove anything anymore. I mean, I think that you know you you've had you've had enjoyed such a great reputation over the years and had such interesting cases that you know uh, I mean it's I don't think you need to have your ego stroked at least is my sense, but you still want to do it. That's what I'm 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 trying to understand. Yeah, but but as I said, I'm going to turn eighty. I don't know how much longer I can effectively do it and enjoyably do it. It gets. Right. Got so what, what happens, I don't know if this you can identify with this, as you get older, the wins mean less and the losses hurt more, you know? Uh, I've always felt that way in my whole life, <laughs> honestly. I, I get much more upset over losing something than winning, than the joy from winning. So yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's competitive, good. but I don't know. The curse of the human condition, I guess, yeah. Yep. Yep. Any, any um, thoughts uh, that you'd like to sort of share for, I guess, I don't know, like I said, younger lawyers that you haven't already woven in? No, I, you know, I've, I've enjoyed the opportunity, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I've enjoyed the opportunity to do what I do with the people I work with, people I trust. I enjoy the environment in which we practice law here in Connecticut. Hopefully it continues. Uh, and hopefully we continue, we will continue to treat each other as people and understand this is a profession. It's not a job. You know, we're not selling tacos here. We're trying to represent people and, and do it well. And that's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very hard to do. It's easy to do a job. It's easy to kind of go through the paces, walk through, uh, but to do it right. God, I think that's hard. Well, well, you do it well and you do it right. And uh, thanks for your time, Willie. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise.